Welcome to the Shell Lubricants Quarterly Town Hall Meeting. Now, please welcome your host for this morning's meeting, Doug Boyle. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third quarter uh, town hall meeting. We've got, um, I think, a very good uh, and a little different of a agenda for today. Today we're going to um, be spending a good part of our time doing a, a deep dive uh, into two of our lines of business, as well as um, having a, uh, a much more interactive question and answer session. So hopefully we get a chance to really get to the, to the hard questions you've all got. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't have a, uh, a, a map on, on the facility uh, for safety, but since I can't be – is it the next map? It wasn't in the printout last night, so there we go. I do have a map. It was too big to send. Um, there are two ways out of the, uh, the facility. Uh, the shortest route would be to go out this door here, and you go down just a, you know 20 yards or whatever and go up the uh, staircase or the escalator to uh, – to the uh, surface level in, sh in one shell. If for some reason that access is blocked, we can go back this way, out the door, and to the right uh, to the two shell uh, facility. Once again, there's an escalator there that we could walk up and uh, walk outside. Um, so those are the two ways outside. Um, nothing is scheduled or planned, so if you hear something, let's take it seriously. Um, the agenda for the day will be that I will go through uh, the uh, global and um, North America HSSE results and then uh, also a quick summary of business priorities, uh, once again from sort of a global perspective. Uh, Duncan will then come up and go through the Shell Group and the lubricants uh, results, including the U.S. financial results. Uh, and then Scott McPherson will come up and give us an update on Sunrise and, uh, and all of its uh, bits and pieces, including Streamline. Um, and then the two, um, two deep dives will be around the Fast Loops line of business. Larry's got some very exciting things to share with us, as well as uh, Paul Murray will be going through industry, um, another area of tremendous change and opportunity for us. Paul will then uh, kick off a, a discussion session where we're going to uh, give you a chance to really work some issues and uh, ask us what's on your mind. And then we'll have a, a general question and answer afterwards. So um, I think we should accomplish quite a bit today. Uh, regarding HSSE, this is a global um, overview. Um, overall, uh, we are doing better than our targets with a few exceptions, uh, the exceptions being fatalities, which we had planned at zero. Um, and uh, as I'll discuss in a moment, uh, we're not at that level right now. Um, and uh, total recordable occupancy injury frequency, or TROIF as it's called, um, we're, those are not uh, on target, but um, – the other measures are performing very well, and that is leaving us, if you'll look at the scorecard, um, Duncan, Duncan will share with us in a, in a few minutes, you'll see that we are slightly better than our objectives for the year. The North America market is really uh, a shining star um, in the overall lubricants organization in terms of HSSC performance. Um, if you'll remember uh, when we uh, put the organizations together and finally got our database right, we found that North America was really dragging down the overall global performance. We set a very aggressive goal of a 30 percent reduction. Normally, uh, businesses are asked to reduce their um, or improve their performance, reduce their uh, frequency by 10 percent a year, and we set a goal of 30 percent. Um, and we're really doing much, much better than that on a number of key measures. Uh, most significantly, the highlight that's uh, here is that uh, as of the end of September, I think we had just breached three and a half million hours, and John, I um, don't believe we've had one since, and we're probably nearing four, correct? Million, November, 10th. November 10th, so we're about two weeks away from hitting four million man hours, which is a, you know, really an extraordinary result. Um, I'll get into the other North America results in just a few minutes. Uh, probably the key low light uh, would be um, that uh, we've completed the um, uh, review and uh, um, uh, we have a lot to learn in Oman with the uh, fatality uh, that was rec uh, of a sales and marketing employee there uh, a few months ago. I think I mentioned that in the last quarterly town hall meeting because uh, I think that there's a tremendous amount that can be learned, and the, the link on the website is still active. Uh, I'd encourage you all to look at it. But this is, a, this is really a, a testament to why the road 
the, the road safety measures that we have uh, mandated is in place. The employee was on a cell phone. They were driving at excessive speed, um, and uh, uh, it, it really is a tragedy that happened. Hopefully we can all learn something from it. Uh, moving forward, our priorities are to, uh, you know, to continue to focus on delivery going forward. Larry will probably speak to some of the uh, priorities with Jiffy Lube um, as there continue to be some opportunities there, although they've made a lot of progress. Um, he's continuing to challenge the organization in that respect. Um, there are a couple of FRD or focused results delivery programs going on. Um, I'm going to butcher this name, but the Lajasolo LOBP, which is in Finland, it supplies, it's the blend plant that supplies uh, the whole Russian market for us. Uh, they're working um, to really reduce the frequency of incidents as it was increasing at an alarming rate, and in the Philippines, uh, contractor management. Um, and. Uh, they use a lot of contractors in the Philippines, so that's a, an important area um, there as well as globally. Uh, uh, Latin America has uh, really uh, generally had a pretty good performance over the years. There's a lot of passion within the organization. I've seen it personally. However, their results uh, have slipped this year. Um, it's a little difficult to measure because the business scale isn't that great, so any incidents tend to throw their number up quite a bit, but they're focusing back against the task. And all the lines of business in all the regions of the world are in the process of cascading the Hearts and Minds program, um, and I, I know that's very much the case in the U.S. as well. So that's the uh, status update uh, at a global level, looking at the North America performance. Um, the recordable injuries uh, is... Uh, um, is uh, well below the goal, um, and that is uh, true in both. Uh, that's true in the supply chain. I, uh, Larry, I think, is uh, the Jiffy Lube organization is running slightly ahead of its target, but I, there's been a dramatic improvement from prior year levels. Um, just something that we need to continue to focus on with some good months and some bad months um, in there. On collisions, uh, we are slightly worse than our goal. Um, and September wasn't a particularly good month, um, but uh, I, uh, I'm pleased to, from a personal standpoint to report really for the first time this year the consumer line of business is uh, now below the goal for the year. Um, and considering um, that that goal represented essentially cutting um, the accident rate uh, in half, um, that's quite a significant accomplishment. I know there's been a lot of focus on it from a training standpoint and everything that appears to be beginning to pay off. Um, but that's obviously an area of some continued opportunity. LTI, lost time injuries, is the statistic that we were talking about before with three and a half moving on now to four million man hours without an incident, uh, which is an extraordinary result. Jiffy Lube as well is well below its uh, target for the year, which is much better than its target uh, for the year. This is one of those things where you're better off to be below. <laughs> Environmental incidents, um, we have already surpassed the full-year goal. This is an area, obviously, that we're, we, we will not make the target for the year because the target was five. Well, I'm sorry, the target, the stretch target was five, and we're at seven to date. Um, but uh, I guess we still have some room uh, for the formal goal for the year. So I think we've made, in summary, um, you know, some tremendous progress, but uh, it's a continuing journey. Um, Moving on to the business priorities, uh, what I'm about to go through are really the global priorities. Um, and I think uh, sort of above them all um, is the need for us to integrate all of the tremendous change that we're trying to affect today through Sunrise and in, in, in with um, our day-to-day -day business priorities and meeting customer needs um, and growing the business. Um, and that is just sort of a superordinate priority um, that uh, is getting a tremendous amount of focus. Um, it's going to be the subject of a, really a week-long series of meetings in November, um, and hopefully we can uh, identify the, the priorities that we can put off for some period of time so that we can really accomplish the core objectives of uh, simplifying and uh, making this business more cost competitive at the same time we continue to grow it with our uh, core customers. Uh, but the specific priorities have been outlined for the next uh, couple of quarters. Um, from a customer standpoint, um, you know, staying focused against uh, the customer um, and making sure that we get uh, onto the right growth trajectory for 2005. Um, at the same time that we need to address uh, some significant rises in the cost of goods. I mean, uh, 
I was watching a, uh, I was looking at a presentation the other day, I think uh, uh, the base oil team had put together, um, where they were correlating base oil prices in crude, and, and the chart stopped at $40 a barrel. And because there's never in history has the price of crude ever really gone above that level. And here we are, you know, 30 or 40 percent above that level today. Um, and so there's tremendous cost pressure on the business. Um, and uh, the, all the lines of business in the U.S. and globally are concentrating on how they're going to adjust uh, the business plans for next year so that we don't get caught on the wrong side of that trend. Um, but uh, we've got to stay close to our customers and work through uh, these cost issues um, that are really extraordinary at this point. Um, which, to the cost section, um, and this is really referring to expenses rather than the cost of goods, um, we need to stay focused on making sure that the monies that we're spending are really delivering a, a return. Uh, we aren't obviously in a position where we can afford um, to spend money that we don't get a return on, and that we take real accountabilities for the overheads that we're generating. From a people standpoint, the key priority at this stage, I would want to reinforce the HSSE um, objectives that we've set and rolling out the Hearts and Minds program and making, uh, getting everybody on board with that. And from a portfolio standpoint, what's cited here at a global level is the route to market project, which, which, uh, which is something that we're pretty far down the road with um, in the U.S. as it relates to the restructuring of the distributor network as well as um, some of the work that's been done under the Sunrise um, uh, umbrella around um, restructuring of the sales organization, and I'm sure that Scott will touch on that a bit as well. Finally, um, one last slide. Some people have asked questions about how OP1, which is the overall reorganization and restructuring of the downstream organization, not just from an organizational standpoint, but around processes, essentially the sunrise and streamline of all of OP, um, is going to impact us, and, and the answer is it will impact us in some ways, and in other ways uh, we will be less impacted than the other downstream uh, business segments. We essentially have already gone down through the organizational um, change, so there's no further organizational change of a significant nature that's anticipated, um, and our focus needs to continue to be on essentially planned delivery, um, but we will be affected by um, – the behavioral objectives and the process changes. And the process changes are really around streamline, um, which is very well integrated into Sunrise and the, and the business plans we're doing. The behavioral changes really refer to um, the, the leadership accountability and teamwork uh, dimensions, the LAT um, uh, behaviors that we discussed in an earlier town hall meeting. So if we can all stay focused against um, uh, you know, the right behaviors, which I know everybody has in their hearts, and we just need to make sure that we um, exhibit uh, and that we support the streamline sunrise uh, activities and stay focused on the customers, and the rest of it will come together for us. Um, let me turn it now over to uh, Duncan, who will go through the results that were announced yesterday. How many of you had a chance to take a look at the group results yesterday? That's a pretty good section. So how much money did uh, Shell make? 5.4 billion dollars, which is a lot of money. <laughs> That's about twice as much as we made last year. So yeah, in indeed, I agree. I agree. I think with all that's going on, I think it's a tremendous performance, I think, to, to have made $5.4 billion. Um, and I think all the other data on here indicates it's been a very, very strong quarter. It's been a strong year so far for Shell as a whole. Obviously, some of the reasons for that are that prices are very, very high in, uh, in the upstream business. We're making a lot of profit on our crude oil, our natural gas. There's also a huge amount of profit being made in refining uh, because the refinery margins in the U.S. and outside the U.S. are very, very strong. Um, and even chemicals uh, year, to, year to date has made a lot of money and made $600 million in, um, in quarter three. So it's been a very strong, strong um, um, performance for, for, for the group as a whole. Um, just for those of you who are interested in accounting details, and that would include me, of course, um, <laughs> CCS earnings uh, means that it's the same number as the 5.4, only we adjust 
for the profit we make on the inventory we hold. Obviously, when prices go up, we make a lot of money um, just by holding inventory, and um, we strip that out when we quote our CCS earnings, which is a number that's compared across all oil companies um, to make it comparable, particularly with U.S. oil companies who use LIFO for stock accounting. So that $4.4 billion is the number that we use to compare ourselves against other large major oil companies. 17.4% um, ROACI, that's return on average capital employed. Um, that's a very, very good result. Um, we, we generally target numbers around about 15%, and 17.4% uh, is, is a great performance. And we generated over $6 billion of cash, which is a lot of money. From operations. From operations. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're quite right. And another $0.8 billion from selling things, um, businesses around the Shell Group. So it's been a very, very, um, very successful quarter, and uh, I think uh, we can be very proud of it as a group. Key features, um, we remain confident, reasonably confident apparently, that, that was the quote that was made yesterday, that we will, um, well, one, it never takes to be too confident, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we've learned this year not to be too confident of achieving, of achieving our SEC proved reserves replacement ratio over the next five years. And to be honest, that's going to be a key measure against which Shell is, 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 is assessed. So we have to get reserve replacement uh, right. And production for this year is expected to be 3.7 or 3.8. Seems like quite a close range there. Bar million barrels of oil equivalent. BOE stands for barrels of oil equivalent. And what that means is they take the natural gas we produce and they kind of turn it into barrels of oil in terms of a sort of a conversion factor and add that up together so that it can all be added together and compared against our competitors. But we make, a, you know, roughly speaking, 3.7, 3.8 million barrels of oil per day. And there had been some uh, short-term decline in that uh, due to all the hurricanes, particularly Hurricane Ivan, I think, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which had caused us to have to shut in some production. So uh, that's recovering um, to, to about that level uh, now um, uh, after they've done all the um, necessary repairs. Again, in oil products, our um, current cost of sales earnings, uh, $1.6 billion compared to $0.9 billion last year. So our, our business, oil products globally as a whole, uh, doing very well, um, very, very profitable. Again, refinery margins really driving that. Um, there is some weakness, uh, obviously, in lubricants and obviously in um, uh, the retail business as well, particularly in the U.S., uh, around marketing margins. That's what you'd expect with such high refining margins. And, um, again, a, a very strong performance. And I mentioned also that chemicals made $600 million. Those of you who've worked in chemicals or been associated with chemicals, it's always good to celebrate when chemicals make $600 million because it doesn't happen very often. So I just thought I'd mention it. So uh, that was the good news. And I'll talk a bit about lubricants results. Um, this is an interesting graph I noticed this morning. There were no numbers on this graph. I think that's, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good thing. I don't know. Um, we we made we made eight million dollars in in, in um, September, and um, that was against a plan of forty six, um, and that obviously is not a performance that we're very happy with. Uh, year to date, on the right hand chart, you can see uh, the blue line is our actuals, and the, the red line is our um, phased plan, if you like. And we've made so far year to date three hundred and five million dollars against a plan of $406 million. And you can see the trend here is not really our friend. It's, it's not going in, in, in a direction which indicates we're going to recover that in the rest of the year. And there are many reasons for that, and we'll get into that a bit later as we go through the highlights and the lowlights. But, I mean, obviously, um, uh, commodity prices, base oil prices um, are, are really making, um, uh, and, and feedstock prices to base oil are making a big impact on our business. Um, you can see that actually as a quarter three as a whole, we had a very strong July. It was a very, very good month for us. Um, and uh, August was, was okay, but September really was a, was a, was a, was a, was a very um, unfortunate performance for us and um, for many reasons, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later. In the U.S., you can see basically the same kind of trend. We made $3 million in September against a plan uh, in the low 20s, basically, which is the same kind of um, uh, performance as the rest of the world. So you can see the same kind of trend. And um, our plan for the year um, in terms of um, where we are is we're standing at 129 year-to-date income in the U.S. against a plan of 197. And our plan for the year was 253. 
So again, it's quite unlikely that we will hit plan, um, and I think um, there are many varied reasons for that, but um, um, that's, that's where the results are. You can see that the trend really since the first quarter has, has really been, um, uh, as prices have risen, uh, we've gone further and further away from plan. Highlights um, globally for lubricants uh, so far year to date. Volumes are broadly in line, in line with plan um, and in line with um, last year. Um, there are some ups and some downs in different parts of the business, but in broadly speaking, we're doing okay on volume, and we're certainly holding market share uh, to the best we can assess it. In the U.S. business, for example, we're, we're definitely holding market share, so that's a, that's a, that's a good um, a good good piece of news. There's been some great um, customer progress in different lines of business. We've won some uh, exciting business in the fleet business in, in Werner in the U.S. in the transport area, which I think is a, should be uh, uh, celebrated. And we've won some business in the uh, OEM original equipment manufacturer business with Suzuki in Hungary, which in the consumer line of business, which I think is also a great piece of news. And Wartzilla, for those of you who are not familiar with, um, I'm not sure I pronounced it correctly, but Wartzilla uh, is a very large uh, power company. And uh, we have, a, uh, after a, a lot of work, uh, have won some exciting business with them in the industry uh, segment uh, in Indonesia. Um, so I think all those can be celebrated and, and, and great news. We've had strong brand performance. Um, in the U.S. Uh, around Quaker State, we repositioned uh, Quaker State, as many of you will know, uh, over the last quarter, and volume is now um, started to grow again, and that's a great success, I think, and we hopefully we'll look forward to that extending into next year. And our uh, Helix 3Rs campaign uh, has continued to, to produce growth in, in pilot markets outside the U.S., which I think is also an exciting event for the consumer line of business. Um, again, for the consumer line of business, I notice a sort of theme here. There's a lot of consumer line of business, which I guess is... is, is, is a, and I was going to say maybe Doug had a hand in the slide. Uh, that we were ordered the um, Spark. And I, don't, I must admit, I don't know what Spark stands for. Doug, what does Spark stand it's, for? It's the, um, basically a retailer um, magazine. They issue this award once a year. Well, well, apparently it's a very, very prestigious award that we, we have been awarded by the, the mass marketing retail industry, which includes uh, companies like Walmart, and uh, that's a great, uh, something we should, we should celebrate as well. Um, so that's all been very successful. Um, and as you probably know, there's the, the, the Lubricants President's Award nominations um, uh, were all made um, by the end of this month, and um, I think uh, the selection of, of the winners will be January next year, I believe, is the timing on that. So that's something we can look forward to. One thing that I think is a tremendous achievement is the uh, improvement in on-time in full, uh, what we call OTIF, uh, performance by the supply chain. And I know globally we've um, got to a level of 92%, um, which is, I think, a tremendous achievement. But also I want to recognize in the U.S. and supply chain that we've had a tremendous improvement in OTIF this year. Um, I'm not sure what the final, what was the current number in the U.S., John? 95 last week. 95 last week. I think that's a tremendous achievement. I think we should congratulate supply chain on that. Right, that was uh, highlights, so um, it must be time for lowlights. And, and, and as I said, um, price is a big impact here. So um, bear with me, we've, we've produced a, a graph to show you something of what is going on in the commodity markets and why it is that it affects our business. So um, if you look at the graph on the right, you'll see three lines. Um, the lowest line is the crude oil price, um, and it's represented here in dollars a ton, so don't be put off by not seeing 55, but it's, it's, it's represented in tons. Um, and you can see the, the, the trend. And you can see um, uh, the second line is, is the gas oil line. Now, gas oil we put on there because that is the feedstock, essentially, that is typically used to make base oil. Um, and so when we make base oil or we judge how profitable base oil is, we measure it against um, the price of gas oil. That is our feedstock. And you, you can see pretty closely that gas oil follows crude oil pretty, pretty, pretty cleanly. So there's been a huge um, spike both in crude oil and uh, a, a very pronounced spike in gas oil, and you can see the refinery margin effect, which is the difference between the two, effectively, coming through. And you can see that on the far right, you can see that gas oil prices have really spiked up um, over the last few months, uh, and, and indeed over, over the year as a whole. Um, so what is, what is going on with base oil? Well, base oil, which is our feedstock for finished lubricants, and also um, uh, the, the part of our profitability globally is, is, is the base oil business, you can see that that price tends over time to lag the gas oil on the crude oil price. You can see that the graph there of um, uh, crude and um, base oil sort of, it, it oscillates, but it oscillates just a little bit sort of less quickly than the crude and gas oil price. And therefore, you can see the difference, for example, between that gas oil line 
today, and the baseload line today is quite compressed or quite tight in comparison to what it typically has been over the last few years. In fact, there's been a huge um, compression of that margin. So what that means, uh, it means two things, this graph. The first thing it means is that the, the base oil business as a whole, which is measured on the profitability between the second line and the third line, has become a lot less profitable over the last few months, and, and that's part of our P&L globally. Um, we actually share 50% in the profitability of the Port Arthur uh, base oil plant, and uh, that's not making a great deal of money at the moment. And the uh, second thing this line means, just overall, you look at the blue line, the blue line is going up. And, um, you know, if you were a betting person, you'd say, well, you know, in order, f as, as margins tend to recover in base oil, you would expect that blue line to go up some more. Um, so there, there really is, I think, a, a, a severe a compression on our finished lubricants margins uh, resulting um, from this um, commodity um, effect. Now, obviously, from Shell as a whole, we're making $5.4 billion in quarter three, and, and a large amount of that is, is due to the um, price effects that are demonstrated in this graph. So um, it, it just happens to be unfortunate for our business that it compresses our margins, both in base oil and in finished lubricants. There's also some disruption in the U.S. to our business based on um, the hurricanes I talked about earlier, uh, which disrupted um, s somewhat of our manufacturing, but also um, demand, for example, in, in, in Florida, um, but, but also up the East Coast. So um, I think that's had an impact on our volumes um, over the last quarter. So um, that explains somewhat of why the September result, for example, in the U.S. was, was, was so poor. The scorecard, what does this all mean for us? in lubricants from a scorecard point of view? Well, um, there, are, there are several measures on our scorecard. and I, I, I'm hoping that people are reasonably familiar with it by now, but I'll just briefly go over it. We have two ROACHI measures. One is a, um, which are basically profitability measures. One is a, a straightforward ROACHI, and the other one's called normalized. And it's essentially normalized for foreign exchange uh, variances. Um, and so it doesn't really give us a great deal of relief against base oil prices, for example. Um, and as a result, those two measures are, um, because of our performance year to date, we're not expecting uh, those measures to return a great deal of uh, um, points for our scorecard overall. OP competitive ranking, that's not just a measure for lubricants, that's a measure for the whole of, um, whole of OP versus our peers. Um, I think we, we measure our, our financial ratios against uh, uh, um, the major competitors that we have. We are at the moment sitting in the middle and therefore that, that measure, which accounts for 20% of our scorecard, is sitting uh, in the middle against our peers. Even though we're making a lot of money, obviously the industry as a whole is also making a lot of money. So um, that's, that, that kind of explains that. Um, and then the other measures, which are not financial, uh, in general we're performing um, above target, which I think is a good, uh, a good, um, a good performance. Um, Doug alluded earlier on to the excellent performance we've had in HSSE, which is what is driving that sustainable development measure to be as high as it is. Um, I think that's in the last quarter there's a push we can do on some of the other measures to kind of get those up into the same kind of range, which would obviously make a big impact on our scorecard, uh, because I don't think the financial measures are going to uh, turn out much better um, for the year as a whole than they look at the moment. So as a result, our overall scorecard is somewhat um, below target. Um, it's, not, um, it's not right at the bottom, but it's, it, it's, not, uh, it's, not looking, um, it's not looking that healthy at the moment. Uh, the current number is round about 0.7. So that was uh, what I came to talk about, and now I'm going to introduce Scott McPherson, who's going to talk about uh, Project Sunrise. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, <clears throat> I think both Doug and Duncan both talked about the importance of Sunrise, and it seems to be a theme in every one of our town hall meetings. We continue to emphasize what Sunrise can do for us from a cost improvement standpoint, and I do believe that's a very important part of Sunrise. But sometimes when we speak to it in just terms of cost savings, we forget what the, the other benefits of Sunrise are going to be. A lot of what creates that additional cost today is the fact that we have a lot of broken processes, and we have a lot of people who are trying to fix the things that fall out of those broken processes. So Sunrise is not only about being able to deliver that $110 million that we define in the United States, but it's also about improving our processes and making our lives all a lot better. And so I just want to make sure that we keep the focus on both of those. I'm going to just give you a very high-level overview today. Uh, we've got a short period of time, uh, but hopefully if you have other questions, we can get to those in the Q&A period. Just a little snapshot on where we are today. I think it's really important to recognize that Sunrise is already delivering benefits. Remember, we started the effort back in uh, February of last year. We closed out the 42 projects that we were going to 
to go after uh, in April, and people started working immediately on implementing some of the uh, ideas and recommendations that were coming out of those things. And so already through September, we've put $6.45 million in the bank, and that's a long way from 110, but it's a start. And, you know, these, these savings that we're getting are going to come in small increments. They're not going to come in terms of 10 and $20 million at a time. They're going to come in sixes and fives and tens, and they're going to add up to the $110 million. So, you know, hopefully we've got some momentum. We can keep that going. Uh, we've got a lot of the uh, program management uh, uh, tasks ticked off of our list now. Those things are in place. We feel good about the fact that we've got a good handle on the projects. We've got the project managers aligned now. Uh, we've got change management incorporated into the projects. We've got a way to track these things and really nail the benefits. And I'm going to talk a little bit about benefits tracking and what we're doing to really make sure that these benefits hit the bottom line. And we're very, very, very rigorous and structured around how we're going to do that. Um, global work streams, I've talked about these in the previous uh, town hall meetings. We also have six global work streams that are underway, and we're integrating our efforts with those global work streams. We're quite a ways ahead of some of those work streams, but now we are trying to understand how does the work that we've already defined that we want to do for 2005 fit into those global work streams, and I'll talk a little bit about how we continue that integration over the course of the next couple of months. Uh, really important factor here that I'm going to highlight in a minute, the order of magnitude of what's been put into the 2005 plan. It's not an insignificant number. It's almost $70 million that's been incorporated into the next year's plan. So it's really important that we stay on task with the target, I mean, uh, stay on, on target with delivering uh, the benefits that have been defined for next year. And then I'll talk a little bit about what are the things that we're doing to integrate the core redesign efforts so that we make sure that we've got this sequenced properly next year to ensure that we don't have a negative impact on the organization or our customers as we move forward for next year. This just kind of gives you a really quick snapshot of where we are on the 40, what now are 44 projects. And it's really that we haven't added projects. We've, we've taken some and split them out for tracking purposes. But you can see when you kind of look down the line over here, you know, we have quite a few projects that we are already into the op uh, option selection and implementation phase. And we still have, you know, a good number of projects, about 18 that are still back up in the early phases where we're still gathering data and trying to generate the options that we think so. You know, when I show you the numbers in a minute that, that, that kind of show where we are overall from a cost savings perspective, realize that we still have a number of projects that hadn't even validated what they're going to be able to deliver in 2005 and by the time we get to 2006. And so here's the numbers that I've been alluding to around kind of where are we in this process today. And so let me spend just a few minutes on this chart. Uh, it's got a lot of numbers on it. Uh, the first thing is, are the charter numbers. We look at that from two perspectives. What were the benefits that were defined for 05, and what are the benefits that we're expecting in 06? And one of the things that I want to emphasize is that when we look at the net benefits for 05, those numbers do not include the planned project expenses. And so you might ask the question, well, why didn't we take those expenses out? And because the reason we didn't is because they were fairly well ill-defined for some of the projects and not at all for some of the other projects. And so it's kind of comparing apples and oranges. So what we did is we put the true benefit target up that was identified in the charters for, for last year. Also on this chart, we've got uh, uh, the, what's been put into the TNR for 2005. And as you can see, that's $67 million for next year. So that's what has been incorporated into the TNR in North America for 2005. So it's $67 million we're expected to deliver next year. Then we've got the number up here, which is the latest estimate. And that's the latest estimate that's been provided by the project managers, depending on where they are in the process. If they can validate the number that was given to them, they've put that number in there. If they validated a number lower than that, they've included that number. Or a number higher than that, they've included that number. And then we kind of uh, have started a little variance analysis here. So where are we on our latest estimate versus what's in the TNR, which is really important for next year? And then kind of where do we stand on where we need to be by the end of 2006? And I'm going to show these numbers to you in every town hall meeting. And so I thought this would be a good way to just kind of level set, recognizing that these numbers will change every quarter. We get an update every month from every project manager around where we are relative to our timeline, relative to our savings, you know, and, and so we're going to have that report. So a couple of interesting things on here that I just want to point out. When you look at the Jiffy Lube number here, uh, because this is going to be important, you see that on our latest estimate for benefits for next year, we show a $7.9 million shortfall for Jiffy Lube. 
However, there's, there's, there's a couple things you need to understand about that. One is the charters were, were, they were just incorrect. There were some assumptions made in the charters about the benefits that we would get out of that from, uh, in the area of depreciation, and they were just miscalculations. The other big thing that's not included in here is the Jiffy Lube pro uh, uh, projects will, will involve the disposal of some of our existing assets. And what's not included in these numbers, in any of these numbers, are the one-time benefits associated with that. So when you look at the one-time benefits associated with these asset dispositions, that's over $25 million of additional benefit that the company is going to get by taking those actions. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this is not necessarily a shortfall against, against where, you know, what Jiffy Lube is doing because this $25 million is going to more than cover that. Okay? Now, that, because we had this in the plan for next year at a level of $1.5 million, it still makes us short about $11 million on the Sunrise benefits, but overall the, that, uh, the $25 million incorporated into the TNR and offsets that for next year. However, when you look at all that, it still leaves us short about $3 million for next year. I'm confident that we'll find other projects that are going to come in, over-deliver against that. Remember, we still have a number of projects that are in the early phases that haven't even validated their savings yet. So I think we're in good shape for next year. We've got to stay focused on this. There are a tremendous number of people throughout the organization that are engaged on Sunrise now. Uh, you know, I've asked you in the past to hold up your hands. I'm going to quit doing that because I think everybody would probably hold up their hand by now and say in some way you're prob probably being touched by Sunrise. And I actually think that's a good thing because the things that we're looking at are about fundamentally changing the way we do business. And at some point in time through the course of 2005, I believe it will impact just about everybody in the organization as well as our customers. And what we've got to do is manage that in a way that that's a positive and not a negative. And that really takes me to the next slide, which is about how do we integrate all this. It's going to be tremendously complex. Um, over the course of the last three months, we've been working all of the individual work streams in the core redesign projects, which are the ones that are really driving the fundamental change. So each work stream has been working independently, making its recommendations to its steering team. And now we started this month the process of beginning to try to bring all those together. And between October and December of this year, We'll have a series of meetings that are going to cause us to take every one of those projects, every recommendation and action that has been planned for those projects, display those in a way that we can see the actual impact on each one of the stakeholders that you see over here. How many times are we going to go out and touch our customers and our distributors? How many of our suppliers are going to be impacted by these recommendations? How many people are going to be required from customer service, marketing, sales, sourcing, and supply to either participate in these projects or change the work that they do today or change the way that they interface with other organizations. And if you can imagine that, that's going to be a huge impact across the organization. Our single biggest challenge in this is, is identifying the data that the U.S. leaders need to help manage that impact. Now, that's what we're planning to do in the United States. The other challenge we have is integrating the work that's going on at the global level in these global work streams, which are completely aligned with Streamline. So now we've got a plan that says this is what we need to do for 2005. We've got a number of global work streams that say this is, these are the things that we want to standardize across the globe for lubricants, and we've got that incorporated into Streamline, or Streamline's incorporated into that to ensure that those global standards match where we need to be for Streamline. So we've got to bring all that together next, in the next uh, three months, and what we really got to do is we've got to sit down and take a look at this from the standpoint of benefits. And if you notice the benefits, that's, that's, that's not just dollars. There's other things that come out of this, again, other than just the dollars. And so it's not just looking at this and going, oh, I can save $6 million. But, but not only can I save $6 million, can I sustain that $6 million? And how is that going to help us with operational excellence? You know, how is that going to make us more competitive than we have been in the past? And then we've got to take a look at all the risk associated with that, you know, What's the impact it's going to have on our customers? Can we sequence this in a way that our customers recognize the value out of the things that we're doing? And can we do it in such a way that our employees can assimilate all that change over the course of 2005? So that's a little bit of update on Project Sunrise, where we are and the challenge that we face. I think 2005 uh, is going to be a, a really interesting year. And I think when we come back together in 2005, we can talk a little bit more specifically about what those plans are that we have in place and what kind of changes you can expect in the course of 2005. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Lane, if you like. Yep.
Thank you, Scott. Fast Lubes, uh, I've got the opportunity to talk to you about what we're doing in the Fast Lubes segment on uh, the operations. I've recently been promoted as or assigned to General Manager of North America Operations. We are, we have a, we've made the decision that we're going to have one way to operate a system. We think that's the most important thing that, let me go back, sorry, missing a slide. Uh, General, uh, again, what we talked about is our mantra for next year is one system, one operating model. We think that's really important. If you look at where we've come from, we're 2,300 stores. We have 230 different franchise entities. A lot of you in this room have dealt with our franchise entities, so to get them to do one way, one, to do it the same way, uh, it's difficult within their own organization, much less as a group. But they've all understood that for us to be successful, we have to have one customer service experience. And to do that, you have to have a standardized set of procedures and a standardized way to train. So uh, we're very happy with the fact that we've got the franchisees agreed upon on that and that they're, they're confident of, of the direction we're taking the company. If you look at our performances past year, you look at the uh, Nibiat, Right over here, our NIBIAP for the year is significantly below plan. It's caused by several factors. One is our, we, we made a decision in March of this year to discontinue the environmental surcharge that we call, we charge customers in company stores. We also have had cost of goods sold uh, increases this year. Uh, we've also had a significant amount of um, negative publicity at the end of 03 and the first of 04. Uh, which have impacted our ability to uh, to have an average ticket increase and sustain the average ticket that we were getting it before. We think that it that it with the procedures we put in place and the standards we're putting in place, we'll be able to correct that in the future. But with that, that's where we are today. Uh, if you look at the car count performance, if you look at 1997, think about this isn't total vehicles because in 1997 we had 1,500 stores and we did 750 million in sales. This year, we have 2,300 stores and we'll do 1.4 billion in sales. So we've almost doubled the increase in, in the number of, in the, uh, in the sales in the system. Uh, in 1998, we merged the q -Lube stores and made them into Jiffy Lubes, integrated them into the Jiffy Lubes. So we added five to 600 stores there. But we must correct the car count decrease on a per store basis to be successful in the future. And that's where we've gotten the franchisees and our own self convinced that to do that, you must have a, a consistent customer experience. But again, uh, we've had, uh, in, the, in 99 to 2000, we had an average ticket increase of 5 to $6. And we believe uh, some of that wasn't done the right way because we didn't have a consistent way to do it. So we think that, th that we are now getting the system back on track, but it's going to take a while to, to reverse a trend. But if you look at some of the things that we're trying to do, we're optimizing our fast food portfolio. We talked about creating a sustainable customer service experience. I'm going to talk to you about J-Team service standards in a minute. Uh, one of the other, th other things that have happened in our, our system is our development has come from acquisitions, acquisitions by franchisees and ourselves of independence. What we haven't had is a lot of new store ground-up development. So most of the development has come from acquisitions, but we're not in the newer neighborhoods. Uh, this year we'll have over 50 ground up developments done by franchisees. We've never, we haven't had a year in the last 10 years of more than 20. So I think this is a significant change. We're also out there, we have a network development group we've, we created and uh, that we expanded in 2004 where we're out there with franchisees, getting them convinced that we must move stores. It's important to move stores three blocks away if the traffic pattern has, has changed. Move stores from across the town to another part of the town. That's the only way you're going to be successful if you're going to be where the customers are because this business is about convenience. So I uh, think that uh, that's something that we're out there talking to franchisees about. We're also putting a plan in place to go recruit new franchisees, which we haven't done in the past. So we're having a process in place for that. So we think the network development is a big part of how it's going to optimize our, our portfolio for the future. The one operating system, one model, again, if you look at the company store performance, like Doug has said earlier, our HSC on recordable instruments, we're down 30%, and because of performance this month so far, we've only had two recordables, so we're right at plan. We've already made initiatives to get that. 
Our lost time incidence is over 50 percent decrease from, from last year. So we've made significant uh, strives in changing the culture of our organization and the GIFLU model from a reactive environment to try to become more proactive. We have a long ways to go. We understand that, but it's important that your employees feel safe in your, in your environment so that they want to be an employee of yours so that they can then give the customer experience to be things. So we think that this has been a great cultural change in, in our company store division. We think that this will allow us now to start focusing on the customer service experience and focus on those things that will help drive the car counts in, in that model. Again, like I said, we focus company store performance with standardized rollout best practices. My team is uh, in the operations group is made up of, a, of people that have been in the Jiffy Lube system like myself for 15 years, have a blend of shell people, and we have a blend of outside people. So we believe we have a blend of great talent that we can move within the organization to, to get the best processes in place and to drive this business in, in the future. Um, one of the bright spots the last uh, few months has been to focus on, uh, focus on the customer service experience. If you look at, like I said earlier, we had a couple of negative uh, uh, campaigns on, uh, on TV in the last quarter of 2003 and the first quarter of 2004, which spiked up our, our customer complaints uh, as much as 15 percent on a comparable basis. But if you look at this summer, by just focusing on that and everyone understanding we need to focus on the customer service experience, we have a, we've had as much as a 20 percent decrease this summer. So we're very proud of, of the fact that th there was a focus on that. In addition, one of the other things we look at is the customer satisfaction scores. Our customer satisfaction scores increased in the categories we look like. We looked at like well-trained, acknowledged, in and out quick, and our pressure score decreased by 2 percent. So we think factors are there that are, that are getting us in place to move us to the next level. And this is without the rollout of J-Team service standards. J-Team service standards is a significant step in, in this organization. It is a computer-based training, interactive, it allows the technician to go at his pace. And then after he goes through that at his pace, he then is, he has to go through a module of on-the-job training that has to be done by a designated person in the facility. This is, a, this is something that we're very, very excited about. Our franchisees have never been more excited about anything else in our organization uh, in, in the time that I've been here. It is, it is we all believe that this will allow us to have the standardized customer service experience. It also goes at length, it has a module on customer service advisor, on how we interact with the customer, how we treat that customer, how we talk to the customer about the customer, about their vehicle and how we educate them about their vehicle and the things that we can do to help them uh, if they'd like us to do that for their, for their car. So we think that these things are critical to the success of the organization. We have, uh, we, like we said, introduced the franchisee workshop. We had 200 operations people, and that is DMs and store managers that the franchisees brought in to uh, Dallas to go through this with. So uh, we, and we had very, very, 100% uh, support by it, and we're, the training implementation is in our company stores this, this month and is being integrated in the next uh, 90 to 120 days in the franchise stores throughout, uh, throughout our system. Again, I th think we're, we've, we've had a difficult year. We're building that foundation for success. We, have a, we need all the help from everyone to continue that. With a good operations, to be successful as a brand, you must also have a good marketing marketing plan, and with that I will turn it over to Lisa Carlson. Thanks, Kevin. So it's pretty obvious you can see from our declining car count that we have our work cut out for us. What I'd like to do is kind of take you through some of the focus areas and plans for 2005. First of all, um, Jiffy Lube is 25 years old, and uh, if, if we think about it, we think about what's happened in that 25 years in terms of increasing competition and how we're perceived by the marketplace. I say the brand is a little bit tired. We've, we've lost uh, a bit of our competitive advantage to some of the dealerships, the other quick lube centers, and mass merchandisers. So we started this work by looking at our customer value proposition to have a standardized way of looking at what is the benefit of coming to Jiffy Lube for our customers. Um, and I would say that 
in terms of the research that we've done, both quantitative and qualitative, the element that we see that is most consistent about people's perception of Jiffy Lube is the fast and convenient. And that's one of the biggest advantages we have when we look at uh, a Jiffy Lube in comparison to dealerships and to other quick lube centers. So starting with the fast and convenient, looking at the other core benefits, we have reasons to believe that have supported all of the core benefits. Um, in terms of our uh, meeting the manufacturer's warranty, that's something that we'll be highlighting in our marketing programs. Uh, this, uh, Kevin alluded to the need for a standard and consistent customer experience. Number six is no matter which location I go to, I'll find the same level of service and standards, uh, kind of like the McDonald's approach, so that people know what they're going to get when they come into a Jiffy Lube. Uh, the uh, national database that we've been promoting, you might have seen the Las Vegas spots, about maintaining your car history so that no matter which Jiffy Lube you come into, we know what oil, chain, what oil you have, when the last time uh, is that you came into Jiffy Lube, and keep all of that maintenance history for you. This uh, is the, I would say, extremely important. It may, may look fairly simplistic to you, but it's the foundation under which we apply all other areas in our organization, operations, training, and everything else we do is meant to be supported by the customer value proposition. Oops, backward. Our 2005 marketing calendar, you'll see a lot of things on here, but let me just point out a few things that I'd, I'd like for you to take note of. We've already uh, uh, are well down the road in developing our Q1 and Q2 creative which focuses, again, on fast and convenient, which you will have seen in our customer value proposition, and trained technicians. The research clearly showed us that when consumers compare us to the alternatives, they see that the people at the dealership, or perceive that the people at the dealership are better trained. Uh, they they uh, call them clean-cut, well-trained professionals. And our ASC certified training program will, go, will help us going uh, a long ways toward changing that perception, training people in our organization how to treat customers and, and do things in a standardized quality way. Uh, we have a, a, a toolbox available to all the franchise organization on a national level for television, radio, and print. And then in terms of uh, promotion and um, a national promotion, for the first time our, we're working on developing a national promotion for um, our, our franchisee community to take advantage of. Um, and we're pretty excited about this. I hope that we can uh, share the plans with you soon. We're working on some concept testing now, but have some pretty exciting plans underway. Credit card uh, introduction has already occurred. We now accept the Shell MasterCard at Jiffy Lube locations. The big advantage is that when you use your Shell MasterCard at Jiffy Lube, you get it counts toward the rebate of 5% toward gasoline purchases at Shell stations. So if you don't have a Shell MasterCard, sign up for one. So not only are you getting rebates through Shell gasoline purchases, but now at Jiffy Lube as well. We'll also be accepting the Shell proprietary card at uh, Jiffy Lube locations. And for people who research it, uh, tells us that people who use the proprietary card are interested in keeping all transactions related to their car on one credit card, this is a big advantage for them. Research, we've developed a cohesive program for 2005 for around brand tracking, around qualitative and consumer research that will uh, link with the work that Amy Rahill and her team are doing, industry research, but also a program that our franchise community can link into. As it is now, uh, many franchisees elect to do their own research, and, and while we may ask basically the same questions and are trying to find the same answers, we've not been very good about bringing that program together. So this gives them an opportunity to leverage the spend with us, and then have group-wide results instead of a market-by-market -market picture. We'll continue with our customer relationship marketing efforts. Um, we're We've been doing quite a bit of work on um, refining our reminder mail program and uh, looking at the intervals for which we're mailing, how to uh, gauge the discount amount to attract the most people. So that work will continue as well. And then we see quite a few opportunities in the area of affinity marketing, so offering 
discount programs to groups like AARP and, and uh, major company employee groups. Some of our focus areas for 2005, and I put at the top here, maximize the relationship between Jiffy Lube and Pennzoil Quaker State. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask how many of you go to Jiffy Lube? How many of you consider Jiffy Lube you, your preferred provider when getting your oil changed? Don't put your hands down if you already raised them. Keep the, <laughs> be proud. Keep those hands up. I, I believe, good Larry, I'm glad you... <laughs> 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 he had to think about it, but he eventually came. Oh, Jiffy Lube. <laughs> I believe charity begins at home. I believe that, that uh, when I fill my car with gasoline, I should use Shell gasoline. I believe that when I change my oil, I should request Penn's Oil or Quaker State. And I believe when it's time to get my oil changed, I should be going to Jiffy Lube. And I believe the same for you as well. So I want you to think about that, and, and for those of you who have not co quite come around to that, I'm going to provide you a little extra incentive. If you will look to the right of your armrest on the metal piece, you might see a red dot. Raise your hand if you have a red dot on the metal piece on your right armchair, armrest. Raise your hand. Not any on this first row, because I know each of you already go to Jiffy Loop. We got one. Who else has one? If you look to your right and on your armrest, here's your armrest, there's a metal piece. Oh, we got two, we got three, we got four, we should have eight. We got two more. <laughs> For those of you who have a dot, put it on your finger and raise your hand. Good. I want you to look. People on the back row are getting excited. See, you, you should not sit on the back row. We never put these things on the back row. You can put your hands down now. Take your dot and give them to Nancy when you leave, and you get a $30 gift certificate for a free oil change at Jiffy Lube. And so when I come back next time and I ask this question, I want to see more hands. I also think we have a clean slate to work with. There have been a lot of changes in the Jiffy Lube and the Pennzoil Quaker State organizations. I think we've got to get past some of the legacy stuff that has been barriers for us in the past, the tension of working together, and start acting like real partners. The, the opportunities uh, that would come from that are tremendous, and it's a win for both of us. I think in terms of the brand, how we leverage the brand, so that when people come into a Jiffy Lube, they're asking for Pennzoil or Quaker State, so that our entire franchise community is pouring Pennzoil or Quaker State, and that we're working together with the sales and brand team to leverage this opportunity. The opportunity exists. I'll be looking to you to help me with that. We've done extensive Sacramento and market testing, Houston market testing with media. And we're reviewing the results of this to see, is there a sustained lift in car count? And there is right now. Uh, substantially to the point that we're looking at rolling out this program in other market areas. Des developing existing co-op relationships um, goes back to developing a field marketing team that is organized by region, east and west, combining both company and franchise marketing efforts to leverage best practices. Uh, and then increasing the number of co-ops to leverage the marketing spend in the co-op areas. And Rick Mullenix and his team will be focused entirely on that this next year. Implementing the National Marketing Fund goes along with the uh, National Advertising Campaign and the National Promotion that we're working on. My role and the role of my team is to convince the franchisees that we have a program that is so great and understand their local market so well that they engage with us on, on the program. And then value engineering study, which sounds pretty uh, dull and boring, but one of the most exciting studies I've been involved with, we had over $60 million in redemption uh, last year from the coupons that, and promotional offers that Jiffy Lube engaged in, which is very substantial. We know we can do it better. We're giving coupons uh, to a lot of people who maybe use it once but don't return, or people who are not promotional. Uh, there is an opportunity to lower the amount of the coupon for one segment of the market and increase it for others.
but ultimately our, our win will come from uh, more effective spend in how we do our promotions this next year. And then implementing the marketing program in Shanghai. As we move into the market in China, we have plans to open our first stores mid, uh, uh, middle of next year and looking at the opportunities there to market to the China market. So thank you. And uh, I'd like to introduce Myron, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the uh, development programs. Why are you saying that? We don't have a great deal of time left for, for fast loop, so uh, I'll move through our, our part on uh, business development outside of North America uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the, uh, the thing I wanted to talk about uh, in, our, in business development is our goal for expanding our business beyond, uh, the, beyond the United States, beyond North America, and into a totally new category. Uh, and the very first slide we want to talk about is, is indeed uh, that effort to move into a totally new category. Uh, beginning in April of, of this year, uh, the, the Truck Lube Development Group, led by ben, Bill, uh, Bob Merrill, uh, began work on uh, a business model using the competencies and skills and processes in Jiffy Lube in the United States to uh, put together a, a model that would work for the truck business. The result of that is a, a, uh, an offering that is focused on local and regional commercial vehicles that we believe will be a, a great sweet spot in the, in the truck industry. And at this point, the team is, is working on modifying the processes, uh, our existing processes, creating some new processes specifically for trucks, and uh, identifying uh, key markets that we want to begin this business in. Our goal overall is to um, uh, prove that we or demonstrate that we can expand on our success in the consumer business uh, and take it into a total, totally new category. Uh, we we be, expect to begin operations in the U.S. in mid-2005 and in a market outside of the U.S. Uh, by the end of 2005. Moving on. Uh, a quick update on, uh, on uh, Project Quick, uh, which is our, our project to bring Jiffy Loop to China. Uh, this is a 50-50 joint venture with the Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation, a subsidiary of that, that company. And our, it, it's based on a localized version of, of Jiffy Lube's model uh, for the Chinese market. Our plan within 10 years is to have a network of 670 stores in the eastern provinces of China uh, and generating upwards of $530 million in, in store sales and moving uh, about uh, 30 million in uh, in Shell PCMO through these facilities. If we're successful, when we're successful in that ende endeavor, uh, we will have the leading share in the Chinese market and a, at a at a share that's similar to Jiffy Lube in the United States. At this point, uh, we're in 11th hour negotiations. We've had a little bit of a delay, and uh, due to some senior management changes at the at our uh, potential partner, but pending the re resolution of a couple of final issues, we've got our joint venture documents and, and uh, the investment proposal uh, complete. Uh, we've got the day one critical systems localized for the Chinese market and development plans for our first set of stores are, are, uh, are completed as well. We've got uh, two of the three key members of our management team ready to go ready, and all we need to do is flip the switch. Project Dolphin is, uh, has been a very uh, exciting endeavor for us. Uh, the goal of this project has been to uh, identify and prioritize markets for expansion outside of North America for the uh, for fast loops, um, and to develop a set of uh, plans for introduction and development that are uh, coordinated and unified between three lines of business: the uh, the fast loops line of, line of business, consumer and transport business. The the, the team that's put, been put together to work on this includes uh, people with, uh, with vast background in fast loops uh, from all three of those business, business units, both for the project team and also for the steering committee. Uh, the, the team is finalizing uh, their, the, the report to the, uh, to the steering committee. It will be presented next week and with recommendations to be presented to the lubricants executive uh, team at the end of the month. And with that, I'll turn it off over to Paul Murray, who's going to talk to, to us about industry. Thank you very much. 
Okay, I, I had a I had a start plan, but I'd love to do I'd love to steal from that presentation on marketing. Actually, big ambition of mine would be get every person in the Shell USA who buys an industrial lubricant <laughs> and get them in the room and hit them with that red spot. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. Okay, as as Doug called this section the the opportunity side of the business. And that's a bit of truth, really. Uh, let, me, let me just kind of establish a couple of facts, which I've shared before from memory, but just to be clear. Industry, shell industry, Europe, $125 million C5. Shell industry, Asia, $75 million C5. United States, biggest industrial nation in the world, save Japan, China, coming up quickly on the inside, $5 million C5. That's a heck of an opportunity if you're standing where we're standing in industry. Opportunity today, but let's talk about the reality of some of the facts that we're faced with and some of the challenges that get up there. Okay. Reality is, if you talk to John Craig in his 20 years, and you talk to some of the distributors I was with this week, who were the top 25 distributors in the country, this is the most volatile, crazy period anyone has ever seen, including the first Gulf War. We will be about to take, along with transport and consumer, our fourth price increase since June. The next price increase will be the biggest price increase, 20 cents. That's the sort of price increase that we're going to be taking on the 1st or the 5th of December, depending on the date we land on. But it's a bit of the reality that we're faced with in today's marketplace. It is the most volatile. As Duncan rightly pointed out, we are at the wrong end, if you will, of that opportunity curve at this moment in time. But we don't really take that as a big problem, frankly, because of the strategy that we've got in place, which I'll talk to you about. Bottom line of it is, you know, we've had a reasonable month coming into October, which is an estimate. It still says we're a long way off as far as the actual business plan is concerned. But just to give you a number to put in your mind, we don't want to inundate you with numbers. The increase in costs has hit us to the tune of $3 million this year. So when you take the red line, you take the blue lines and cumulative and you add $3 million to it, you're not a million miles away, said the Irish optimist. <laughs> Such is life. Moving on, let me, this lot on this chart, let me draw your attention to three lines. The green line at the top, you know, when this business really started to get into its turnaround phase, we were pulling in $3.28 in terms of proceeds. We're now pulling in $3.50. Has been as high as $3.55. Now, that would be great. That was always the plan. What was never the plan was that the red line would go exactly where the red line has gone, and you're going up from 255 to 283. But that still means, as far as the blue line is concerned, we're holding our own. The industry is under pressure. Not shell industry. The industry is under pressure. There is no oil major making a great deal of money in this industry at the, at the minute. So it's up to us to structurally show how you can make money. And we believe we've got the right strategy to do it. We also believe one of our competitors, our biggest competitor, ExxonMobil, is dragging the mobile section of that business away from speciality because of the way they run their business, because of the P&L account they run their business off. And that is opening up a heck of an opportunity for us. We didn't go in to plan to take that opportunity. We've had the strategy, but that opportunity exists. Not much to say on volume. It's pretty steady, give or take the odd price increase. But it is pretty steady. Um, really the reason for putting this chart on is to give you an indication that if you go back to the first half of the year, so this green line at the top and the blue line, you know, you can see inexorably going down, going down and getting to points where you're really questioning why we, why we have the business. We did lose money in April and we did lose money in May. We haven't lost money since, and again, back to the optimistic side and the opportunistic mindset, but the lines in terms of best fit are going up, both in terms of the actual and in terms of the plan, obviously but the actual is beginning to match the plan because of some of the pressure points we've got. It's still going in the right direction. That's the main message. We're beginning to start to rescue this business because that's what it needs. Summary, we implemented the turnaround mid-year. We aggressively priced four times, as I say. We have reduced costs by 20%. All of my people have had to have very serious conversations. We have lost 20% of our workforce. We've lost people in Houston. We've lost people out there in the field. We've had to do that. That's just the reality of the business we're in. We now have our costs around $1.5, $1.6 million a month, as opposed to $2.1, $2.2. That's where we need to be, and that's where we will continue to be. Completion and support. I'd like to personal thanks, actually, to some of the people in this room who connected with me personally after the last meeting when this 
focused driven growth strategy was, was, was a working session. People give me input, we now have it finalised, the challenge now, like any, any strategy. Thinking of the strategy isn't the problem, executing the strategy is the problem. So I'm going to move into a lot of execution aspects in the moment. Nothing really else to say there except one thing, hydraulics relaunch. My team are very proud of this, so I'm going to put it out there and ask my colleagues at the front, who don't need to look at it, to pass it back. Essentially, take, well, you can. You might want to use it, Larry. Um, basically, what you've got is a test going through for TELUS Premium products, which we've launched in Q4 with the assistance of the supply chain. We couldn't have done it without supply chain and without getting base oil transferred to us. Thank you, everyone who was involved. But that's just some of the marketing activity that we're putting through with the distributors. That product is driving after the premium speciality strategy that we've got. Battle to keep costs under control. I, I'm going to highlight this last point, this final one. We have one of our regions which was 6% down in volume, 21% up in profit. One of the other things we're beginning to discover is we shall leave an awful lot of money on the table through not negotiating and holding steadfastly to pricing rules and guidelines, particularly in the distributor market. Down 6% but up 20% in revenue. That would get us our target next year without any increase in volume. That'll get us the 10 million C5 that we're responsible for getting. So quite an important message. Um, where do we need to get to? What's the reality? I'm going to do this story again. I've just told you the size of industry in Asia. I've told you the size of industry in Europe. Very difficult, equally when you're a consumer in the United States and equally when you're transport in the United States, very difficult to get incremental growth at a high level. So the industry business can contribute considerably to the overall journey that lubricants is on because we can grow incrementally as per Baby Bear, for those of you who will remember it. Baby Bear can grow the most of the three bear family. We see ourselves as the pair that can grow the most. What does that actually mean? Okay, 14 to 15 million dollar C5. I think probably knowing my boss as I do, it'll be 15 million in 05. There's lots of fives in there, so he'll be comfortable with that and he can keep going after me with it. So we may as well just say it like it is, 15 million. And to go back to Scott's point, five million of that's gonna come from Sunrise, one third. But still, 10 million of it's going to be squarely on the shoulders of the team that I'm representing standing in front of you. So that's really our challenge going forward into next year. But 10 million incremental growth is hard to come by in any business these days. Challenge in bridging the gap. I'll get us back in a little bit of time here. I'm going to talk to you really about the strategy. I mean, this is the business that we are in globally. Marketeers, sellers of lubricants and lubricant-related services. That's what we're about to small and medium enterprises. But just check out some of the complexity. I mean, some of the multiple sectors, 4,000 products, 50,000 employees, lots of different cost and value-led CVPs. The United States is a great example of trying to do everything to all people. And we're about to stop that. We're about to have some hard choices coming our way. What we want to be when we grow up is we'd like to profitably drive industrial lubricants and lubricant-related services to be the number one position in the United States amongst the oil majors. There's nobody's really number one at the moment. It's a very strange market. Everyone is five, six, seven, eight, nine percent. Nobody is 20-something percent that you normally see in most markets. There is the opportunity for one of the industry majors to take the business by the scruff of the neck and structurally change the way it does business, structurally make it profitable. We would like to be that major. That's the challenge we've set ourselves. Focus premium price products. I'll come to a chart in a second and explains why, but also cost competitive high volume products. We are Shell. We're not into selling a thimble full of product for a million dollars to NASA once every year. We need trucks going in and out and in and out. We are Shell. We have a reputation. We have a brand size to support. So we want a mixture of both. We're working with John's team to try and decide some of the production rules that we need so that we don't make 1,500 gallons of product and spend a lot of money on 600 gallons of product flushing the system. Bad business. Not a business you want to be doing. You need to be getting to some of the rules that we're working on. The sectors we want to work in, general engineering, power generation, metal working and food and beverage. Fairly straightforward. Another major highlight, geographic prioritization. A lot of our effort will go into three key areas next year. Midwest, Northeast, Southeast. We are badly underrepresented in the Midwest. We have a 2% share in the Midwest. We have a 7% share in the Southeast. We need to get those things rectified. And, and you, everyone knows the United States as well as I do, whereas most of the industry is in the Midwest. 
So those are big areas of focus for us. And last, by no means least, a customer mindset. The people we work with, our team, are determined to have a customer mindset. They know what they've got to do, but enough of being technical advisors to distributors. We will be salespeople who commercially drive our business with any partner who cares to work with us. This is the strategy in one chart. It's very simple. There's two messages on this chart. I've got some other smart words coming, but this is the strategy. Okay. There's two messages on the chart. The first one is, as Shell, we've actually lost unit margin in industry across the four key sectors I've talked about. Now, a lot of people could sit here and say, well, actually, all we're really doing is properly costing industry these days. It's not getting the free ride it got before. I would challenge back and say we have to get a bit smart and see where that yellow bar can get back up to where it historically has been before, especially in the speciality areas. That's not really the big message on the chart. The big message on the chart is around 60% of our volume and business is in there, where there isn't a great deal of margin. Less than 10% of our volume and business is up there, where there's a fairly enormous margin. Our challenge in the strategy is whilst defending the position we have at this lower end of the chart, growing as rapidly as we can up to that top end of the chart, where there is a lot of money. Some of the sorts of numbers that play around up here, eight, nine dollars a gallon profit. The sort of number that plays down here, 50, 60 cents. So that's the strategy and a final, and just in a nutshell, really. I'll give you the smart words now. Edges, we want to drive the competitors. We've got people working on edges. We're quite determined about one thing. There isn't a customer we've yet to meet who buys a sector. They don't buy sectors, they buy products. We want them to buy the most profitable products, we want them to buy the shell products, but to do that, the onus is on us, and in fact it's on every business, to have defined competitive edges. Why would you buy us more than someone else? And that's what that team are working on. The hydraulic strategy, that little bit of block that's being passed around, the strategy has been launched. We now have two upper levels of premium brands. Those are the ones that perform well in that test which is being passed around. But that's been launched in Q4. And this last point, which is very much a a discipline both internally and externally to rigidly apply our pricing and management disciplines, both by getting the price up, but not by leaving money on the table. Okay, the sectors, how does that work? Well, basically those sectors are going to do a number of things. They're going to define the products, name the customers, direct and distributor, particularly direct. We haven't been great on direct these days. And also get the geography, the goals, and the ambition regarding delivery. As far as other levers are concerned, we're looking at everything we can in terms of the structure of our business. Back to a little bit to that first chart I showed you regarding the way the, the, the margin has dissipated for us. Let's get back and understand, even through things like significantly reducing the SKUs, we plan to take out 45% of the SKUs in our business. In fact, we've already taken them out. We're just waiting for the Sunrise team to allow us to do something with them, which they're going to do. Lubricant-related services. We all in industry in our hearts like the aspect of lubricant-related services. It kind of goes beyond pricing. It gets you to talking about the servicing of machinery. It gets away from just the basic liquid. But I'm afraid our heads and fact-based decision-making and control of our cost demands that there is a business case to go with it. Again, the team are working on that. And last, by no means least, we really are working on the retention of people. We have recruited people as well as lost people. We have recruited people who are going to be working to drive the business forward in the sales sense, in the commercial businessman sense, and also making sure that they're passionate about making a difference back to that point of being part of a journey that we all want to be proud of. The distributor channel, the direct channel, I'm going to skip over this. We're doing all the things you would expect. We're naming them. We're targeting them. Freeman's group has put together all of the route to market. Let's understand which each one of those customers is on the hook to deliver, and then in our case, add 20% to it and start working with them every month, every week, every day to deliver it. But we can do that. That's not a problem. I really, I don't want even to, not to read this chart. This is just to show you about the execution. An awful lot of smart words. Let's just talk about what exactly is, is happening in the business. And you can see some of the things that already have, and I'll pick a few highlights. Name, direct, and distributor targets, hydraulic repositioning. I'd like you to check the fact that there are names, and PM even appears in there a couple of times of things that people are actually going to do, when they're going to do them as part of executing this strategy. Um, John, we were already so bold as to take the 95% for Q4, but you know that. And going through precise geographies and everything else. So in summary, and more or less to close this and get into the questions, what we want to do, we want to compete. We want to spend more time with customers who are the right customers, the profitable customers in the right geographies. We want to have a competitive mainstream product range which gets us the volume 
but we really want to focus on the priority range upstream, differentiated speciality. The hydraulics positioning will be the first of a number of repositionings we will do. The competitive edges, meaning what is it that you sell to the customer, what is it that you use, the ammunition that you've got, we're going to have that, and then com cost competitively supply what we sell. The comments we have as a group are really all captured on the bottom line. We really want to stand up, be accountable. We want to stand up and own this business because it's our business and we really want to be proud of it. We want you to be proud of it and we want people to talk about industry as the journey that everyone wanted to participate in and looked back on as something that they were really pleased to be part of. I'll leave you with two short quotes. One of them worries me, one of them doesn't. Apparently Napoleon said, you know, give me a leader but just make sure he's lucky. <laughs> That's the one that worries me, okay? <laughs> But then a very good golfer, a certain Mr. Player said, do you know the more I practice, the luckier I get? <laughs> We're into a lot of execution, a lot of practice, and everybody in this room can help, so thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move swiftly on into group interaction. Um, help me here, the front team, if I do anything wrong at this moment in time. Okay, we're going to break into discussion groups. I gather that doesn't mean you move. You kind of just form natural groups that you're in. And really the challenge of this session is getting out the questions that you may not want to ask yourself, but if you're representing a team of four or five people, then you can ask the question because you're speaking on behalf of the group. So that's just a little mindset thing going into this. Develop the questions you've got. Please ask the questions that are in your mind that are worrying you, if there are any. Or ask the questions that you feel are right at the front of our, all of our interests at this moment in time. Select a spokesperson and then ask us your question. How long are we going to take in this, eight or nine minutes or something? Yeah. Okay, we're going to take about ten minutes on that. Form yourselves into groups. You decide who your groups want to be and we look forward to hearing the questions in ten minutes. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Just a few uh, rules of order here. I, I'm going to randomly um, select people as they raise their hand uh, for the questions and I'll assign them to the appropriate uh, leader to respond. Um, I would uh, ask that you wait until you receive a microphone um, so that you can ask the question while the room is relatively small. It will be impossible for those who are watching this on the webcast to hear the question if uh, you do not have the microphone. So if you could just please wait um, for that. And uh, who, would, who has the first question? Back there? Okay, fire away. I was handed this question and... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good one. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the question is, why is Fast Loops pursuing the uh, truck business when we recently celebrated the sale of Speedco? Great question. Sounds like, uh, Larry, um, yeah, you're probably in the best position to address that. Yeah, it sounds like a transport question. Uh, we, don't, we don't know why they sold Speedco. No, uh, uh, to be honest with you, the, uh, uh, there's a fast answer for that. Uh, we had a partner in the Speedco business, and the partner didn't want to expand. Uh, so... Uh, that business is the one that Bob Merrill was closely involved with and all the transport people. And we actually wanted to buy out uh, the partner in that program. Who, uh, and that partner uh, thought it was worth a lot more than we did. So we actually wound up selling it to him. And we get the chance to start that over again then. But, uh, uh, but fundamentally, the partner wasn't interested in, uh, in expansion in the ways and in the places where uh, they were most attractive to us. And so it was... Uh, faster, better to part ways and start over again. And there was a significant profit made on that transaction. <laughs> <laughs> Which we can then apply to expansion again, yes. Okay, on the second question, once again in, in regards to 
expansion with the fast loops. Is there any consideration to uh, adding fast loops to existing uh, gas stations that may have convenience stores and um, convenient uh, we, we actually have one franchisee on the West Coast who's done that in a couple of cases, and uh, that's worked successfully. Uh, generally speaking, the way the gas station is laid out, it doesn't fit the fast loops model. You don't have drive-through uh, facilities. There's, uh, the uh, the uh, service facilities are built to the back of the lot to allow room for the gasoline up front, so you're into a back-in and uh, pull-in, back-out mode. Uh, but uh, we have a franchisee named Paul Morabito on the West Coast who's recently purchased some of the surplus retail sites that they've had for sale. And uh, he's redeveloping those uh, to, uh, to have both gasoline and uh, fast loops operations on them. And so where we can find the right site, uh, we can. But uh, basically, if you've got a going concern there that's generating cash, uh, you're and you're scraping that site to make it something new, then you, uh, it's hard to make the economics turn on it because you've already got a viable business on site. So taking one off to build another one, uh, the marginal increment doesn't, the, the incremental income you get from that uh, doesn't justify the incremental investment. It is a model we use uh, quite a bit in international markets, um, some, of, some of whom are quite successful with it. Yes, uh, next group. Oh, don't be shy. Yes, thank okay. you. There I am. I have a couple of Jiffy Loop questions, and then I have an industry question. What are the specific Jiffy Loop plans to improve their HSSE performance, given that they have high turnover traditionally? Okay. Uh, number one, a couple of factoids. A year ago, the, uh, the Jiffy Loop turnover was 150%. This year we have it under 100, and uh, which is high, but a uh, major improvement uh, that we have. And actually, uh, uh, Doug and I were up at uh, Walmart uh, for the last management team meeting we had. Was it the August LET August, that yes. we had here? And we were talking to Walmart about what their turnovers uh, were, not just in the automotive uh, section, but inside the store where it's air conditioned and. Uh, Working conditions are a little bit uh, better, and what we find out is that 90 uh, percent isn't far away uh, from an employer the size of uh, Walmart. I mean, one of the one of the savings that we have in our business, and one of the opportunities that we have, is this is the first place that a lot of people get a job, and uh, they come to us, they get trained, and uh, then we move on. And so I, th I think uh, talking to the franchise community, reading the industry trade press, uh, Lubin News, what have you. Uh, uh, that 90 is uh, looking better to me than it did uh, a year ago, and it's certainly the trend on it is right. Uh, in terms of our total recordables, I think Kevin uh, mentioned the fact that we've reduced those by 30% this year, which is no mean feat, but we're still at a level that's too high. And our goal is to take another 20% uh, down on recordables uh, in 2005. Uh, our goal for HS&E on lost time injuries for these staff that are turning over uh, so quickly, as I've just talked about, uh, was, uh, was uh, a rate of six for 2004. We're running at about three and a half. And the 2006 was a 30 percent, uh, that, that rate of six was a 30 percent reduction from previous years. So to uh, make a long story short, uh, Bob Franknet has been, uh, his group is deeply embedded uh, with the working team that we have uh, inside the operations uh, group. Uh, we're also taking the HSE, HSSE standards out to the franchise community. There's a store standards committee, and we're working with the franchisees to understand uh, not just the safety, but the environmental perils associated with uh, operating these sites. And so it's moving pretty quickly through the network overall, but uh, but from a level where you had to improve, but uh, I think the improvement's going to start getting harder from this point uh, as, we're, as we're coming down farther. I'd also say we're doing benchmarking, and uh, we happen to know that we're performing better than Valvoline Instant Oil Change. And when we look at some of the global businesses, uh, Shell Consumer have a business called AutoServe. Maybe some of you have heard of it, maybe you haven't. Uh, uh, but to, uh, to put things on a par, that business has a lost time injury rate of about 10 versus ours of 
So, uh, so what we have to do is continue to uh, work on this thing every day of every week, uh, but understand that there's probably not the level that we're going to get to that we have in a refinery where we have uh, tenured employees of an average of 20 and 30 years working inside a fence. And, uh, and we, have to, uh, we have to really understand the risk management dimensions to, uh, to keep this going at the right pace, but to keep it continually moving downward. Well, what were your, what, pardon, what were some of your big wins as far as the safety measures that were put into place? Well, the measures were recordables and lost time injuries, uh, but there's just a lot of basic things. One of the things that we did was we appointed a person on the crew at every site to be the safety coordinator. And that person gets a little bonus and you walk in and it's not just the store manager or one of Kevin's staff uh, saying, don't do that anymore or do it this way, but we actually have a peer that's saying, put on your safety glasses. Uh, get somebody to help you pick that up. Uh, we've instituted a tool program, you know, and these are just really basic things, just making sure that people are using the right tools and the right jobs because while that rate is high, the severity of injuries is really low. Somebody bruising a knuckle, uh, somebody needing a stitch, things of that nature. Uh, we put in a, a shoe program. About a third of our incidents in the stores come from slips and falls. And so we've, uh, we've uh, mandated that employees have to wear safety shoes. We've uh, instituted minimum standards. So a lot of this is just very basic stuff uh, that you have to grind out. And, uh, uh, but they make real step changes in the functionality. Thank you. <laughs> well, actually, Jiffy Lube isn't quite off the mark yet. Uh, okay. Come on back. As part of the Jiffy Lube standardization plan, and I've probably called that the wrong name, I apologize, but are clean customer areas part of that standardization plan, stemming from the survey where particularly women have a certain trepidation about the uh, cleanliness of Jiffy Lube areas? No, we, we looked at that and we decided to optimize around dirty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you have a sense of humor about that. The, uh, but uh, no, to be very candid, I think it's a, it, uh, we are going to standardize. It's a separate initiative than you heard Kevin talking about and one of the items on uh, the team of uh, uh, leases uh, for 2005 really is more than just the customer service areas. We understand it's critical. Actually, people don't want much. A uh, pretty basic standard would make a lot of people very happy and we need to get there. But we think we need to do that as a part of an overarching program. You know, uh, store number one, you know, all the Jiffy Loop stores, they have a, a store number. And Jiffy Loop started off with number one. And by the way, number two is still open. It hasn't been redecorated since it, uh, since it opened. <laughs> and uh, you drive down the street and you see a, light, a lot of white buildings that now look yellow. You see a lot of red and white signs that now look pink and yellow. And uh, we, we think what we need to do is uh, go through, develop a set of store standards for the exteriors and interiors, and uh, prove in the marketplace that there's a return on investment associated with uh, re-imaging those things. And, and the franchisees now are coming to us, and they're, they're taking the bull by the horns as well and understand that they really need to uh, have an upgrade of facilities overall. And we'll, uh, we'll prove that out in 2005 and, uh, uh, and, and uh, with uh, success, plan on a major implementation in 2006. Okay, Paul, now it's your turn. <laughs> Those eight stickers go a long way. <laughs> <laughs> Small cramped handwriting. Is it on the table for industry to acquire a currently weak food and beverage specialty competitor to meet your growth targets? Um, the best way I could put that is the bank manager needs to have a bit more confidence in us first. Um, when you lose money in a couple of months in the one year and, and don't really get yourself on a steady growth pattern, we're, we're beginning. The trajectory is getting up there, but it's a bit like owning a house actually you know if you don't pay the mortgage it's very hard to get the bank to lend you money for an extension so what we're looking to do is get the bank manager one of whom sitting right in front of you fairly confident that we can pay back all the bills and make a profit it would be it would be an ambition that we would love to foresee and, and actually achieve in 2005 yes but we've got to get a lot of people on board who've got very fact-based mindsets 
Okay, Duncan, open up the purse strings. Well put. Very good. Yes, next group. Did I see a hand? Oh, back there in the middle. Yeah. Give us a second to get the microphone now. There are two questions. One, uh, first is for Jiffy Lube. Are there any plans to expand into Canada? Well, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the answer is I think we've been in Canada for how many decades, uh, Kevin? Uh, uh, we've been, we have sites uh, uh, in Toronto. We have sites in Vancouver. Uh, recently, what we've done is we've added a development resource to uh, grow those sites. We're in the process of working out a franchise program, a uh, franchisee financing program, uh, so that uh, people can develop sites uh, faster. Uh, there's a, I've been up there recently, and there's a lot of interest uh, amongst the franchisees up there to, uh, to grow the network. We've got, I think, about a total of 42, 43 sites uh, in Canada, uh, but it's... Uh, it's tough to make the model work with the percentage of cost of goods up there. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's filters and not oil you're talking about. <clears throat> Actually, I know that the consumer, from the reviews I had yesterday, the uh, team up in Canada on the, on the lubricant side is working very closely with uh, Jiffy Lube folks up there. We're very interested in expanding the concept. Second question is around uh, Sunrise. What are we doing specifically to make sure that uh, Project Sunrise and Streamline are aligned? One specific example would be we're doing U.S. skew rationalization. How is that linked into product life cycle management within Streamline? Very good question, Scott. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, what, we're, what we've done is we've assigned an individual from the United States to participate on each one of the global lubricants teams. And each one of the global lubricants teams is actually aligned with one of the Streamline activities. Product lifecycle management happens to be one of our global projects, and Streamline has a global product lifecycle management project. So those, that's where we bring those two together. We've got a team here in the United States right now. They've developed the overarching uh, process down to what we call level five. And in the United States, we're now taking that to level six and seven. And what that basically means is we're defining how would that operate in the United States. It's a common process, common set of roles and responsibilities. And now how do we overlay that into who's going to do what in the United States, who has what decision rights, and who's going to be the process owner for that process. So that's how we're bringing those together. Listening to the uh, discussions today, I thought to myself, and I commented to Paul <coughs> that um, I'm sure that this would be very confusing for most people uh, either watching or participating in this with all the code words that are used for everything. But an easy way to think about it is Streamline is really um, an OP-wide series of initiatives designed to standardize and uh, st really standardize process primarily. And then what we're doing with Sunrise is basically building on top of that a series of uh, process improvements and cost reductions um, that are very, it builds on top of Streamline. I've seen, as I'm involved pretty closely with a number of the projects, that they are very well integrated. The teams are making sure that we don't essentially pass as two ships in the night. Um, although there are a lot of buzzwords that are flying around, the people who are close to the projects are making sure that we don't end up creating those conflicts. Um, and there is a lot of things moving simultaneously right now, but they're really building on a foundation. Just think of Streamline as OP-wide and Sunrise as the lubricants component focused around cost and focused around lube-specific processes. Okay. <coughs> uh, yes, other questions? Uh, Cindy, yes. I think that our questions will reflect the marketing makeup of our group. But uh, the first question is for industrial lubricants. We'd like to know uh, what criteria is used to determine uh, the marketing programs and how do we gauge the effectiveness of those marketing programs when we're talking to a B2B customer? Okay, it's actually quite tough because of the, the situation with the distributor being someone between us and the end user. <coughs> but the uh, marketing programs, I mean, first measure, the obvious measure is have you achieved the gallons that you needed to achieve? Are they profitable gallons? So that's very, very straightforward. We aren't anywhere near as sophisticated as our partners, whether that be Transport, Jiffy Lube, or anyone else. I mean, this is a very basic business, and part of our issue has been 
that we have been way too complicated. We've been trying to bring almost sophisticated marketing techniques of advertising and brochures. The biggest thing I have heard from distributors was, you please stop giving us 60-page brochures. <laughs> yeah. It's like, give us a one-page sales sheet or give us the plastic thing that I can touch and show my people that it works after a test. And really, that's what a lot of this is about. It's very basic. I mean, we've got a very small marketing department, and that will continue through 2005. It kind of goes against the grain a little bit for me, but that's reality. Thank you. And our next question uh, would be for Fast Lubes. How do the uh, business models and the market development uh, plans vary from Project Quick to Project Dolphin? Myron? <laughs> Well, first of all, Project Quick uh, started out as a, as a joint venture, pursuing a joint venture with uh, SAISC, as I, as I said. Uh, so the, we, we were working with a, a joint team there to develop the, uh, a very detailed plan of how, how we're going to enter that market uh, and learned a great deal, quite honestly, and, and much of that has applied into the work in, in, uh, in Dolphin. But uh, as far as the, how we would approach the next market in Dolphin is going to depend a great deal on whether we end up pursuing a joint venture with someone, uh, you know, doing a series of master franchises, going uh, into it ourselves. depends on, on a number of different factors. Plus, uh, Dolphin is about uh, not just looking at franchise models but also license models. So uh, it's, I would say Dolphin is more uh, comprehensive in, in kind of bringing all tools to bear. And, and for Quick, it was very focused according to the oppor opportunity that w was presented to us when they, they first came to us. I would just add, um, while we have yet to open up the first store or even finalize the agreement with SAIC in China, um, that relationship, uh, uh, two points. First is that a relationship's already paying off with us very well because uh, they happen to be the a joint venture partner of both VW and General Motors in China. And as a result of that um, of close relationship we're developing, we've uh, converted most of the car dealerships uh, uh, that they control within China over to Shell, which is a really uh, tremendous boon for our business there. Um, and it's also a, another example of a, a PQS synergy in that Originally, SAIC was uh, focusing against uh, Valvoline for this offer, but we really offered the best combination of uh, lubricants and fast lube business model, and um, we were able to give them a much better package overall. So it's, it's really just turning out to be a tremendous relationship there and, and one that works well across the lines of business. Uh, yes, question in the back. What are some of the things we can do um, or start doing or are doing to manage and influence the price of base oil, and it's instead of just raising our price on the street. Well, as um, I don't know, John, whether you want to touch on this as the uh, supply chain individual, <laughs> or Duncan, you have any wisdom to add? But I mean, at this point, you will take it. Okay, would you like to? <laughs> Good form, Doug. Well, I'll add if I have anything else to add. Please, Duncan. Well, it's essentially in the U.S., there's almost nothing we can do to affect the price of base oil would be my easy answer because the price of crude oil and the price of gas oil are going up dramatically. And, we'll, and I think what you're seeing is the base oil is going to go up even further, my observation. So I think what we can do to actually affect it is, very, is pretty minimal. Um, it's, it's, it's a marketplace. Um, there are some players in the marketplace stronger than us. Um, I, I just don't see us having a great deal of influence over it, to be honest. Um, so. I don't know about it's as much about changing the you know the price increase or managing that. It's about how we handle the impact of that. What can we do as a company, as employees, when that happens? Besides just raising the, the street price, what are things that we can do? Because it all links back to the cost of goods sold as well. Yeah. Okay. That. Uh, all right. Okay. Um, that's another dimension to the question. Yeah. Because I would just say that I, I think that this is uh, you know issue out of our control and in fact if anything to the chart that Duncan showed its margins have been so compressed that we should expect further acceleration. Not to um, uh, 
say the same thing over and over again, but the single most important thing we can do is to focus on the delivery of the Sunrise uh, initiatives uh, because we're trying to reduce our, our overall structural um, operating costs so that we can be both more efficient in cost and more effective in terms of simplified processes in working with the customers. It is not going to eat into a large share of the base oil um, impacts, but uh, it does help contribute to it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's really about all we can do with it, except that uh, recognize that our competition is going the same thing uh, through the same uh, struggles that we're going through. It's unprecedented. Yes, John? I mean, there's a, there's a couple other things that we can do, too, and Todd Miner, who manages base oil, is here today. Um, we've actually been fairly successful at renegotiating some of our supply agreements. So when you look at uh, folks that we're buying base oils from today, getting smarter about the way we buy and what we're buying is helping us out. And then from a formulation perspective, are we using the right base oils in the right products? So rather than putting really expensive Group 2s or Group 3 base oils in something that doesn't really require that high technical, high cost base oil, Let's make sure we're using our Group 1 supplies, our Group 2s, our Group 2 Plus, and Group 3s in the right products to really optimize the, the costs that are in there. Thank you, John. That's a very good point. Um, and, and those uh, renegotiations have saved us a lot of money. Unfortunately, you can't, it's hard to see it because we're dealing with such a rising tide, but they are quite significant. There were two questions that came in um, over the Internet that uh, I'd like to make sure we address um, uh, to help encourage uh, people to participate in the uh, webcasting in the future as well. Uh, the first one I'll direct to Duncan. Um, it is, uh, how is the financial community perceiving our efforts to come clean, in quotes, um, on our oil reserves? All right. That's a good question. Um, let me think. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, from the fin I'm not a member of the and we're talking about the external financial community here, right? And so I'm, I'm not a member of that community. I, I think Shell's message to the financial community has been, one, the reserves issue as a whole, we have um, made uh, a, a lot of um, press announcements and a lot of internal uh, work around getting the, the reserves processes and the audit processes around our reserves to be as transparent as possible. Uh, I think there's still ongoing work going on on assessing our reserves for year-end this year. Um, which some announcements were made about uh, yesterday uh, in, in terms of, of still ongoing work in that area. Um, I think the, the area which um, we're shifting much more to in, 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 in what we're focusing on in terms of our strategy is, is understanding how we can actually find more oil, bring more projects on stream um, over the next five to ten years. And that's really, I think, where the strategic um, value is going to be in terms of, of how Shell's uh, is perceived in the, in, in the external marketplace is how we, how we do it, finding oil and bringing big projects on. Um, for a period of time in, in the late 1990s, we, we, we found relatively little hydrocarbons, and as a result, um, our reserves position today is not as strong as our competitors, and I think that's a, that's a public fact. And I think as you extrapolate that forward, it means our production is not going to rise as fast as our competitors. So it, it's, really just about, um, it's really just about putting that in perspective uh, and, and, and uh, getting our, our processes and our EMP business around finding oil and, and bring it on stream. It's, it's a relatively simple business in a way. It's all about finding oil and bringing it on stream, and that's what we're focusing on in the strategy we're, we're developing going forward. In that direction. Uh, last, the the um, second and last question we received uh, was um, regarding Jiffy Lube. Um, and uh, Sunrise, there are two parts to the question. The first is, what type of response are we seeing from the franchise community? And two, will smaller franchisees with limited resources have the opportunity to expand? Is there an even playing field? Well, taking the last question first, uh, yes, there's an even playing field. And... Uh, uh, we're soliciting offers from, uh, from all manners of franchisees, and, and, and going to the first question, we're receiving interest from all kinds of franchisees, and uh, we have some big ones that are, uh, uh, that are industry consolidators, and uh, you might know them by the name of, for example, Heartland, who are uh, gobbling up sites and uh, becoming quite large. They're interested. And then we have people that have two and three sites that are interested in uh, 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 buying various of our uh, uh, company stores that are for sale. 
And then on the property side, there's two, el there's two elements of Sunrise. You saw uh, Scott talk earlier about the one-time gain of $25 million, but there's also uh, a one-time return of cash before tax to the corporation of $100 million, uh, about 95, 96, and, uh, which is no small thing because turning back $100 million is uh, funds uh, lubricants capital program for, uh, for a year almost uh, in effect. And, uh, and that money comes from two things. One is selling the enterprise value of our uh, company sites that are out in the market to be disposed of. And the other is from selling uh, real estate that we currently lease to franchisees. And, uh, and every franchisee, if he's leasing or she is leasing a site from us that we own, has the opportunity to buy that property. Uh, if the individual doesn't want to buy the property, there is a wide interest uh, across the United States. Uh, real estate is a good market. It's a time to be a seller uh, right now. And so, uh, so to answer the question is, uh, yes, it's a level play playing uh, field, and, uh, and actually there's been, been a very favorable response coming in from all manner of franchisees to purchase both company stores as well as underlying properties on existing franchise sites. Thanks, Larry. Um, just to wrap up, uh, Kelly would like to uh, give us all some uh, an update on the uh, United Way Drive, and uh, here she is. Yes, I just wanted to um, update you. Mark Carroll um, is our lead volunteer for Lubes this year for our United Way campaign. I'm sure there's probably volunteers here that are also um, participating. I like everybody to give that crew of folks a, a good strong round of applause thanking them for their contributions. Um, Mark gave me an update. We are, um, last year we made, um, raised $182,000 through company or through employee contributions. Uh, to date this year we have raised $189,000 with a target of $200,000. Today is the last official day um, to do your pledges, um, although e-pledges can be done online through November 15th and still receive the company match. So I'm here to thank all the contributors for your generosity and um, encourage everyone who hasn't participated to um, consider making a pledge and um, go online or contact your local volunteer. So thank you all. Thanks, Kelly, and I second that motion. It's certainly for a worthy cause, and we'd appreciate your participation. Um, and that brings us exactly to the end of our two-hour session. Um, I thank you very much for the time and for the questions. Uh, I hope you found it worthwhile. <laughs>